And I am uh, appreciate you coming on, and, and we'll keep it really uh, informal. It's always fun. My show is uh, is one of those things where it's just been kind of something I just a passion of mine, and and I love talking to good football guys. I've been around it for a long time, as as you have as well. So, uh, if you're tuning in right now to Bridges Brawl, uh, we are joined by the famous Field Yates, ESPN insider, and and one of the probably the best looking guys on TV. I know that. Uh, ESPN's ratings went up a ton once uh, Field came on there full time because they got more uh, women viewership. Um, so Field, I appreciate you, uh, <laughs> I appreciate you jumping on here. And, and you know that's kind of the thing I wanted to talk about a little bit with you is is I think people see you on TV and people know you know the game, but give us some backstory. I don't know if a lot of people really. I mean, even on the little background and, and you know where you started and stuff. But how did this? How did number one football become a passion for you? But two, then how did you immerse yourself into understanding the complexities of the game as well as you do to set yourself up for that position with ESPN? Yeah, so in terms of how football became a passion of mine, I don't know if it was something that I was necessarily born into. My dad is from Hawaii. He was much more of an individual sports player. And I think that, well, it doesn't, it's not that you have to have team sports in your area that inspire you to play a particular sport. You know, my dad didn't have a local hero like someone who grew up in, let's say, Cleveland may have had may have had with Jim Brown of the, you know, or somebody who grew up in New Orleans right now might have in Michael Thomas or Drew Brees. Um, instead, you know, my, my dad was much more of an individual sport athlete. My mom is from Columbus, Ohio, though, and grew up a huge Ohio State Buckeyes fan. So um, I did have a little bit of influence from my parents growing up uh, in terms of my loyalties. Uh, but football sort of always just was something that I gravitated towards. I love team sports. I played basically every team sport imaginable. And then I ended up sort of following football and lacrosse as my two that I was most passionate about. But football was always the game that I felt most at home, at ease with. And I think it was a combination of, you know, the team aspect of it, the thinking man's aspect of it, the meticulous preparation that is required to win a game every single Sunday, or in my case, as a Pop Warner player, every single Thursday night or Saturday <laughs> afternoon in high school or college, things like yeah. that. So the sport just encompassed, I think, all the, the, the attributes that I sort of try to live my life with. I think there's a lot of good that we can learn from the sport of football. I like being a teammate of people. I like relying on people, and I like having people rely on me and earning and building that trust that I think is essential in order to be successful, not just in football, but also in life. So football was pretty clearly a passion of mine from a young age. But what I also realized that I didn't really make too many myths about my own future was uh, I love football. I already, I always knew though there was a cap on my football career. And I'm not trying to be self-deprecating, not trying to make a joke of my own expense here, but I knew I was not going to be a professional athlete from a relatively young age. I knew that I was uh, loving the game and enjoying it, um, but I was not going to play and make money uh, for my lifetime. What I was going to be able to do, though, was perhaps find a way to involve it. So um, I always wanted to be a coach growing up. Um, my, my goal actually was to replace I'm, – I'm from the Massachusetts – I'm from Massachusetts, so from the Boston area. I thought I would replace Bill Belichick as the Patriots head coach. <laughs> I joke with people now that I'm glad I ditched that plan because yeah. uh, Belichick's still going strong. It's 2020, and he might have 10 more years in him. Um, but it allowed me to pursue pursue some other passions uh, within the world of football. And I was fortunate to spend some time with the Patriots uh, during high school and college. And at the risk of boring people, I called an internship. It's not exactly something that I uh, applied for. Uh, when I was uh, in high school, I had the opportunity to – ball boy a Patriots rookie minicamp by knowing someone who knew someone that knew someone and that turned into basically me being a gnat and hey I'll come back for the next minicamp and the yep. next minicamp and I'll come back for training camp and next thing you know I spent basically every moment that I wasn't at school either in high school or college uh, at Gillette Stadium and uh, it was I tell people that it was kind of like my football Rosetta Stone right? It was my opportunity to learn how to evaluate players, learn how to speak the football parlance. And we all can tell people like it's easy for us to say that Patrick Mahomes is an incredible quarterback. But I thought that spending time inside the building helped me understand what are the specific attributes and traits and, and nuances to his game that make him better than basically every other quarterback that is currently playing right now. And 
Uh, my time at the Patriots was a springboard. I eventually, after I graduated from college, got hired by Scott Pioli, uh, the great Scott Pioli, who was the Chiefs general manager at the time. Uh, he hired me to his scouting department. And so next thing you know, I'm spending a few years in, uh, in your state, Missouri, um, and uh, I learned a ton, had an incredible opportunity to sort of see every bit of the exposure full time, as opposed to just doing it when I wasn't at school and to have, uh, you know, a, a paycheck uh, every couple of weeks, which was you know, new to me, having just graduated college and being on my own. Um, but it was a great experience for me. And to sort of tie it all together, after a few parts of a few years in Kansas City, I, I would love to say that I had this light switch moment where I said, all right, I know exactly what I want to do. And it's I want to go work at ESPN and I want to be on TV. The answer is I didn't know that. But what I did know was that I wanted to stay in football in some way. So I ended up moving back to the East Coast, which is where I'm from. I started a blog, very, I mean, this is, we are talking mom and pop uh, operation uh, to the max here. And that led me to sort of writing for free websites and meeting some people through social media. And boom, next thing you know, we, uh, I, I reached out to Lord knows how, 50 people probably. And uh, I got linked up with a guy named Mike Reese. Uh, I, I've used the word great to describe Scott Pioli, the great Mike Reese as well. And I became uh, friends and he gave me an opportunity to come help, help him at ESPN Boston, uh, covering the Patriots a little bit. So life had kind of come full circle. And one thing that I admire about ESPN is it's one of those companies where if you can do one thing, they figure out if you can do two. If you can do two, can you do five? If you can do five, can you do 10? And for me, uh, one was helping out Mike Reese with the Patriots coverage at ESPN Boston. And eventually it turned into a role that includes what I do now, which is television and podcasting and real football and fantasy football and news breaking and analysis and some writing and everything else in between. That's awesome. I did not know you were at the Chiefs. That is a that is awesome deal. So were you over there with Scott Aligo and Terry Delp? Were they there with you as well? They sure were. Scott Aligo is still a good friend of mine now. He's uh, obviously at Michigan State uh, doing a great job there working on the new staff assembled by Mel, Tyker, uh, Mel Tucker. And then I believe T is TD. I think he still might be with the Chiefs. He's right? still I think there, he's man. Him and Willie Davis. So the yeah. best part about this, Willie was, Willie was an intern for me in Green Bay when I was working for the Packers. And so it was great. We'd, we had, we'd have Willie, you know, during the summer internships or training camp, he'd go get us food and, and uh, he'd go, you know, get, pick up uh, guys' workouts at the airport. And I tease him now all the time. Now he's got a Super Bowl ring. And, and I joke with him. I'm like, hey, you know, you owe me like at least one of those dimes because uh, I helped you get your start. But, um, you know, I worked for the Chiefs for a year for uh, Vermeil's last year. And then that's actually what led me to, got me to Missouri. I worked for uh, – uh, Vermeil's last year there, and then of course he retired, and then of course they brought Herm in, and, and Herm had a rollover in staff, and so of course nepotism at his finest. Uh, the job that I was slated for went to his son, um, which is <laughs> that is the football that is the football world. But you know, I got to know that Aligo and Delp were both interns when I was working over there, and and both great guys. And yeah, you're fun. and now you talk about a full circle your Patriot story. Aligo is now recruiting my son to play at Michigan State, so. Um, it's been a how it, about that wow that's amazing yeah man it, well you know that's field you've been in this long enough and you know even in just a short time you've done this you, you know especially when you latch latch on to the Patriots way and and, and what the Patriots have done I, I talk about it all the time and and I, I don't think it's appreciated enough especially not in St. Louis <laughs> because of because of the <laughs> boss and, and you know Spygate and all this other stuff but the Patriots are they are what there'll never be another dynasty. There will never be another franchise like that in the world. And, and people will say, well, you know, what about the Steelers? What about, you know, in the seventies, what about the, uh, or eighties? What about the, um, you know, 49ers? You know, what about the, 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 the Broncos? I said, well, number one, the Broncos cheated to help get theirs. They circumvented the cap when they had won their two Super Bowls uh, under Shanahan, but the Patriots, you can say what you want about get, getting the job done. They did this in a salary cap era too. And that is, especially at the quarterback position, to get Brady to continue to come back year after year at lesser salaries. When, and he was still making good money. But what they did with cast-offs or guys that – because they weren't really a great drafting team. But they, they would hit on the guys they needed to, the Gronkowskis. But they – Belichick knows how to play to his guys' strengths, like anybody else. And that's why he is a genius and why he is, I think, the greatest. Yeah. Player. But so for you to be able to latch onto that, 
and then you know kind of use that because that extends out to Dimitrov and and you know to so many other you know Phil Emery when he was with the Browns and so that's awesome that you got to be able to be a part of that and and in and this small world those guys will still take care of you as you as you grow in this uh, game it's awesome that's I, I didn't know any of that that's awesome to hear that stuff I think people are gonna and we'll, yeah and what was cool it's been cool for me is first of all all the people you mentioned and they're all great mentors and friends and people that I you know have learned a ton from and can continue to learn a ton from but what's I think is is neat about so much of what we learned in football, and I'm sure you can speak to this as well, is that I really do think a lot of it can be applied to life as well. It's not, you know, I understand that life does not involve, you know, 10 teammates on the field with me at all times, but there are a lot of things that you learn in football. Um, it's trust, it's, it's design, it is creativity, but it's also things like in football, you can, you know, I always think that coaching is whatever you're given, getting the most out of it so in life whatever the circumstances you have dealt to you it's making the most of those so I always felt like football uh, helped me feel more equipped to handle the rigors of life day to day we talk about this all the time I, I actually work with a lot of youth athletes and and talk to them about that on a daily basis is this COVID issue I think football helps it, sports in general but football especially with what's going on in our country with 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 not only COVID but with just the social issues I, I tell these guys all the time, there was never a point in the huddle where I said, okay, I'm not going to make a play for a guy because of the color of his skin or his religious affiliation or his political affiliation. It was when we were on that football field, we were a team and we worked together for one common goal. And I think that is what this world needs a little bit more of. And, and I think that's why getting football back in whatever form that is, NFL and college, I think it's a huge deal. And I think that's why so many fans and people gravitate toward football because it is a microcosm of what the world could and should be like. Totally agree. And football, you know, there's, there's sort of a, um, sort of a sanctuary element to the locker room, yep. and which is why, you know, people feel like, um, you know, sometimes there's too much media coverage because you want these guys to be able to have a life inside the walls of their locker room. But uh, sort of separating from that issue, like I just truly believe that the opportunity to uh, count on people in a way that, you know, in football, as you were saying, from the time the ball is snapped until the play is over, you're only thinking about accomplishing your goal. And it's not about who it is next to you, what that person looks like, what they believe in. And it can be a real – football can be a binding experience in so many ways. I think it makes it so unique and part of the reason why, uh, you know, I'll forever, I will forever have it be a part of my life in some way, shape, or form. That's awesome. Hey, I got to ask you too, because I think so many people, I love it. I think it's probably one of the best dynamics on, on, uh, on TV and, and, and in sports media. Relationship with Matthew Barry. I mean, it is, I laugh every time you call him dad. I think that is probably one of the best, <laughs> that is one of the best little inside jokes ever. Um, how did that cultivate to be, because he is kind of known as the fantasy guru guy, been doing it for a long time. I mean, he was on a Peyton place for yeah. his sake. How did he, uh, how did that relationship kind of come about and, and how has that, has that materialized over the years? So when I uh, was on the fantasy focus podcast, they had, I think there were six years in or seven years in, it was a while. It wasn't like this was some brand new up and show that needed the fresh reboot, but uh, the original host, a guy named Nate Rabbits, who is an executive at ESPN, who just got so busy with this like real job that didn't have time for the podcast. Uh, they had built something special and really unique. And so when I stepped in, one thing that I knew right away was that if the podcast goes downhill, no one's going to look at Matthew and say, oh, you got worse at your job. They're going to say, <laughs> oh, Field wasn't good enough to fill in for Nate. And so I realized quickly that Matthew and I needed to have a show that was comparable to what he and Nate had because people had really grown to learn and appreciate it. Um, but I also had to find a way to make sure that I wasn't simply trying to be Nate and doing exactly everything that Nate did. Nate was incredible at his job, but it was going to be hard to replace him uh, in that way. So I felt like we had an opportunity to sort of build our own dynamics and it's been really fun. Matthew and I have the natural age gap that you recommended I, or that you referenced. I look younger than I probably am as well. So what I've realized is some people will tell you that, like, you know, you can't sort of latch on to the same jokes over and over again. 
Whereas I found in our podcast world and certainly in the world of football media, like sometimes you just got to play the hits, right? Yep. If it's working, keep going back to it. Why deviate from what has worked? And that seems to be one of the things that has worked for Matthew and I. So we have a lot of fun when you spend every day together for an entire football season. Um, you tend to have, it, it sort of develops into a sibling-like relationship, right? Some days, most days, your best friends. Some days, you, you know, all you want to do is go at each other. Um, but that sort of fun banter is what makes the show, I think, unique and different. All right, here's what, the one thing I got to ask, though. How does he get a role in Avengers and you do not? Because that is, I yeah. mean, like, iconic. Maybe my favorite movies of all time, outside maybe Lord of the Ring movies. But I'm sitting there watching. All of a sudden, there's Barry holding the briefcase. And I'm sitting there like, what? How did, like, I had no idea he was going to be in it until it actually until I saw the, the movie. So first of all, when the movie came out, I was substantially jealous for a while. I'm not going to sit here and lie and try to tell you otherwise. As you mentioned, legendary, <laughs> iconic movie. And he's got a, a piece, a, a, a role in it. I don't care if it's a small role. It's still right. a role. Um, but the crazy part is Matthew taped that scene. I want to say 18 months before the movie was released and he left. He had to take a day where he had to go to uh, the scene. I think it was in Atlanta. He went and taped it and he had to leave work for a day. And he came in and he's like, he, the day or two days beforehand, he called me up and was like, I got something to tell you. I need you to, you know, you, you literally need to keep this under wraps. Like I'm gone for a couple of days and here's why. So I had to sit on this, incredible piece of information <laughs> for like i don't even for 18 months and it was one of those where like the the first week i was like oh this is really cool like you know I, i'm super jealous but it sort of faded away from my mind for a little while yeah but uh talk about like a, like that's a like a literally once in a lifetime experience for him and uh really cool i'm jealous but uh I, i'm jealous at the same time like i am also happy for him i know how much of a of a fan he has been um and I think it was like that's bucket list stuff, right? But I didn't, you know, what? it's not even bucket list. You know why? Because no one actually has on their bucket list like be in an Avengers movie because they right. don't actually think it could happen. So that right there was really cool. The fact it's unbelievable, just because he is so because he is so self deprecating and because he is so you know smart and intelligent and, and you know him. I mean, he's kind of that. He fits that football nerd, right? Like that. He is the epitome of what I consider. Uh, a fantasy guru because he is one, but he's the guy you kind of envision that would be good at fantasy, right? That would start this whole thing and, and would, and would make this be that would dominate at, at, at all the information and, and, you know, in a way kind of taking, you know, all these cybermetrics and all the things beforehand, all the analytics before football really, you know, started incorporating in scouting and, and into front offices, he was kind of doing that for, to gain fantasy points. And so then to have him be in like one of those sci-fi kind of nerdy, you know, geeked out movies, even though they're the greatest movies of all time, uh, it was just, it, it was apropos. I thought it was perfect. And it was, I was so stunned to see him in it. And again, I was jealous. I'm like, that's it. I could have got into fantasy football for sporting news in the year 2000 and started writing for them. They offered me a job and heck, I could be then in, in, in the late teens in an Avenger movie. If I'd have done that, are you kidding me? So it was uh, that was absolutely it's, great. Is he still? I mean, he's got to brag about that. If that's if that's him, that's what I would have on my byline. I wouldn't even have anything about fantasy, you know, guru or being an insider for ESPN. I would have star of you know the Avengers movie. He, he he definitely reminds me of it far too frequently, and 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 I give him credit for it. I would do the exact same thing. Um, I'm not sure how long it takes before that becomes a tired act and gimmick. But we're nowhere close to that point. Matthew will forever remind me that he was in an Avengers movie. And I can't blame him for it. Again, I can't blame no, him. It's good for him. You know, that's I, what I, don't I, would know what do, the, I would have Robert Downey Jr.'s number on my cell phone. And I would just like every time you started getting cocky with me on a show or, or anything like that, I would just go up. Oh, I'm going to call Robert Downey Jr. See what he thinks about it. Let, let me ask him. Let me ask you know, first. And then go from there. That would be awesome. Seriously. Oh, that would that is be great. amazing. So good for him. I, I, as much as I don't like to admit it, I am impressed by uh, the fact that he was in an Avengers movie. You got so w let's get to some football. And so there's a lot of stuff going on. And, and did any of these franchise tags, any of the deals that got done, the Derrick Hen the Derrick Henry deal getting done surprised me. Only for the fact that I thought it had to be a team friendly deal. And I think with the numbers 
it, that when they all come out in the wash, it will end up being a Titans deal just because running backs, we've just seen what the running back deals lately. Um, this, unfortunately for that position, it's just, it is what it is. Even though I think he deserves the money, he also runs hard. And, 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 you know, it reminds me a little bit of Larry Johnson used to be with the chiefs. And, and I think he's going to, you know, he'll be, he's got two or three or four more good years. Or maybe hopefully he proves me wrong. Hopefully he's a Frank Gore career, but um, that deal getting done, did that surprise you? And there's any deals that didn't get done that surprised you? Um, so Derrick Henry surprised me only because it felt like for a long time the momentum was trending towards no deal. Um, and then obviously things change, but I'm actually not surprised that Derrick Henry himself would want a deal. And here's the reason why is Derrick Henry's value is I mean, maxed out right now, right? Yep. He the best. He was the leading rusher in the NFL last year, an iconic playoff run. Maybe they'll repeat that success, but you know, even if they don't, um, I think no one will ever question the merits of Derrick Henry's 2019 season. COVID has cast this cloud of uncertainty over us right now. Um, the football salary cap, who knows what's going to happen, right? I mean, if the salary cap goes down next year or stays flat, it's not like the market for running backs is going to increase. Mm -hmm. And then I think one of the themes that I think Derrick and – you know, his, his representation, he's, he's a Jimmy Sexton client, probably is smart enough to know is that next year, you look at the running backs that are going to be free agents, they're all awesome. Yep. You look at the running back class in the draft, it's pretty strong. Yep. If the Titans played this year out and Derrick Henry comes back next year and says he wants a deal that surpasses Christian McCaffrey's or whatever it is, yep. the Titans would be saying to themselves, hey, we love you, Derrick, but – we have an opportunity to go get somebody in the draft, somebody in free agency that might cost us a fraction of what you're demanding. So I thought it was smart that Derrick Henry took the deal that he got. Um, and then the reason why none of the deals that didn't get done or the deals that didn't get done didn't surprise me is only because of the COVID uncertainty yeah. and players not knowing, uh, or I should say probably teams not knowing what's going to happen. Um, I, I would have guessed four months ago or three months ago, that somebody like Justin Simmons would have had a long-term deal done with the Broncos. But that just speaks to the power of COVID is that teams are having a really difficult time projecting what the financial windfall is going to be here. Yeah. I mean, we're going into, I think you retweeted, I think it was Schefter put it out there that I think this is the, the first time or, or the most franchise tag players playing on a season. And I think that you're right. I think it speaks to the COVID issue. And this off season has just been so whacked out. If there's no preseason, um, you know, what's going to happen with, you know, with the, with the rosters, what's going to happen if someone in the locker room gets COVID. I, you're right. I think this just, this off season has just been in, 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 not only in the sports, but in the world has just been thrown off so much by, it. and I think that's the, you're right. It, it's, if I was a player, I would bet on myself. I think you're right on the Derrick Henry. I mean, I know you are running back, take the money while you can get it, especially because of those points you made of, of the free agents and in the draft class. But um, you know, I, I think money in hand nowadays is, is, you can't, you can't, you got to bet on yourself that you're going to then continue to make that down the road. Uh, but I'm always a fan of, especially with my agent days is get as much money as you can right now uh, when you are hot, because that can evaporate. And we've seen it uh, so many times uh, over the history in the course of, of football. So that is, um, I think Henry getting done. I was, I didn't, wasn't surprised about Dak because I, I'm not as big, maybe a fan as a lot of people are Dak, but I, w I thought maybe some of those pass rushers, I thought maybe Judon or, 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 or Barnett or, or uh, Dupree, I thought one of those guys would get done for a team-friendly deal, but uh, it doesn't, you know, it, or, or like you said, Simmons, or, or I thought Harris, maybe Anthony up in Minnesota might get something, but um, I think you're right with the COVID deal uh, that, that has thrown everything off. Um, let's switch this over now. Is there the Chris Jones deal getting done? I thought that was a, that's a phenomenal deal for, for the Chiefs. Uh, the one that did surprise me that I was surprised they, that there was this money it was was Miles Garrett. Did that surprise you at all with Cleveland? Was the surprise that it wasn't more, or was the surprise that it was as much as it was for you? I, I well, I just my whole thing with Miles Garrett. I think he is a, a great player, and I think I was surprised it was what it was when it was, and, and because of the fact of what happened to him last year, being suspended for you know hitting Mason Rudolph with his helmet, and and not that he's that doesn't make one mistake does not make you your career, uh, but I thought it was for them to pay him when they did was surprising to me. So I think the calculation for Cleveland is probably this. 
if we do the deal right now, they're looking at it as a seven year, $145 million commitment. So that's about $20.3 million per season. If they let this thing play out a year or two years, the total money they're going to pay Miles Garrett, assuming he has a, the, the trajectory that he seems to be showing off, is it's going to be even more than that per year. So typically these deals where the team signs a player after just three seasons yep. age pretty favorably. The Chiefs, the Eagles are amongst the teams that have done a really good job at, like Travis Kelsey and Eric Fisher with the Chiefs and Zach Ertz and Lane Johnson with the Eagles. Some of those guys have really – I think, aged well contract-wise. Um, so I actually think that the Browns might look back at it one day and say, like, this is a pretty good value for us. I also know that Cleveland feels like what happened in Pittsburgh last year was the ultimate aberration. Yeah. Uh, that, that, was not a, that was not at all – like, that's not the Miles Garrett that they know day in and day out. A guy who obviously has been incredibly productive – on the field, but it's also been a huge pillar of their locker room for the right. past three years. So um, I thought it was – I think it'll end up being a deal that Cleveland looks back on favorably. And as for, like, Garrett, it, you know, I never begrudge guys. Like, could Garrett have waited a year and maybe signed for more money? Sure. But sure. he also is going to be making $125 million over five years. Like, that's generational wealth. Miles right. Garrett's grandkids' grandkids – are all fine now because of that contract that he just signed. Yeah, and I, that's, you know, it's, there's, that, there's that balance. And you know this, I've been in, in front offices, you know, with the Chiefs and, and haven't been around the Patriots. Where is that balance? And, and as, an, as a former player and scout, and then going when I was an agent, finding that happy medium was always tough, right? It was because when you, were, when you would talk to a team about a guy coming off three years, you have so many agents and so many, you know, media people would always say, hey, you got to wait free agencies where you can max out your dollars. But then there's also something to be said, and I say this all the time, there's something to be said about the grass isn't always greener on the other side. And if you're happy and that, you know, I talked about this with Patrick Mahomes. Everybody's like, oh, he should have, you know, he could hold out through his, you know, got two franchise tags and, and done all this other stuff. And in the same amount of time that he, that he did you know, the deal in five years, he would have made a hundred and, and 50 million. And right now he's only making 141. So there's a $9 million difference. And I said, you know what? But that $9 million difference, you can put the money you're making now, that guaranteed cash and that signing bonus in the bank with good financial planners. And over the course of time, I'm not saying it's going to make $9 million, but there's also the, the, the stability of home of, of Kansas City, knowing you're going to be the franchise guy, that marketing dollars you're going to now get because you know you're locked in at Kansas City Chiefs. The cost of living is cheaper in Kansas City. There, it can make up for that value of that $9 million down the road and so if you're happy take the money now because you're right it is generational and, and for a lot of those guys that never had that that now set them up forever and so I, I was always there's always that kind of sticking point but when it's all said and done people talk about it in the it's a cool 24-hour news cycle to talk about hey well he should have done this or he should have done this and because that's what people want to talk about but when it's all said and done that guy when he's in his 40s or 50s and he's retired Nobody's going to really care about it. Oh, he only, you know, he was short at a million dollars. He's still set up for the rest of his life. So I, I, I applaud Miles Garrett for taking it. If that's the deal he felt like it was that he wanted to do, if he wants to be a Cleveland and, and can hopefully try to turn that franchise around, I think it was a, yeah, it's a good deal. I think for both sides, I just was again, a little bit surprised it was done when it was done. And I was surprised because of he's had success, but it wasn't that Aaron Donald, uh, big time pro bowl type success. I was, I was surprised that they, they paid it this soon because I thought that was one you could have waited on a little bit. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, it'd be interesting to see if any more extensions get done yeah. this offseason, uh, however long this offseason lasts, because right now it's only been three in that 2017 draft class, and they've all been notable deals. McCaffrey, obviously the highest paid running back, and, yep, and, then, and then, of course, Mahomes. And now, finally, we've got – uh, Miles Garrett. So interesting timing, uh, but I think ultimately probably a deal that satisfies both sides. You just may have some people that, that nitpick at it because that's what we do with contracts. We nitpick yeah, every single contract available. Hey, all right. Well, quick, I know you, I want to get you out of here soon, but give me, you got to help. My, my listeners need, they, we all need help in fantasy. I do too. Uh, but is there a guy or two 
this year that people, deep sleepers, maybe in their, in the, when they draft early, we don't know when the season is going to be, but that they can kind of target and say, all right, this is my field Yates uh, sleeper. I can get him maybe in the sixth, seventh, eighth round, even maybe later. Is there some guys or one or two guys that, that, that fans can target and say, all right, this, this is going to be my guy that's going to help me win a Super Bowl? All right. So deep sleep. So I always, um, I always put this as a sort of a caveat for sleepers is that sometimes I name a player that's like, you know, the Pittsburgh Steelers third wide receiver. And people are like, dude, I know that guy. I drafted him five times last year, right? right. So if yeah. I say Deontay Johnson's going to have a good year this year, yep. some people may say, I already know Deontay Johnson. But Deontay Johnson is not one of those names that, like everybody is speaking about in the great wide receiver debate, right? right. Yes. A good example of a player that I think is due for a good year, Deontay Johnson. Um, I do think that uh, if you're talking like real deep sleepers, like somebody like Russell Gage for the Falcons, that's like a real deep sleeper. Yeah, the guy is. that wow. like no one is really talking about that has been drafted a bunch. So those are examples of different layers of sleepers. Players that I think I'm a little bit more optimistic on than others, and this is not a sleeper in any way, shape, or form, but like David Johnson I'm more optimistic on than most. Now, I get it. Um, he's not an explosive runner. He has not averaged more than four yards per carry, I believe, in four years. But David Johnson is an is unbelievable pass-catching running back. And while we can chew apart the decision to trade for David Johnson and specifically shipping away DeAndre Hopkins, yep. he's the number one guy in that Houston backfield. And fantasy football is about opportunity plus talent. So David Johnson's a guy that I am more optimistic about than most. So that's kind of a sm- sort of a, a, a scatter plot of different players that may not necessarily be sleepers, but are, you know, that have, I'm more optimistic than most based off where they're being drafted. Well, I'll get Russell Gage that you dropped that is that's, I never would even, I looked at him. So that you got a little bit of tidbit there. I need help. I need your expertise on this. So I have been in a fantasy keeper league for, uh, 15 years almost. So there's actually a lot of NFL media guys in this league. Um, and so we all, it's a very prideful trash talking, uh, you know, league as, as you are. As well. And we have our, we have our keeper league. And so our keepers are due here shortly. And you can only keep one guy that you've drafted in the top three rounds each year. Right. So if you draft the guy in the first, second or third round, you can only keep one of those guys. So I'm asking you, and this debate was on Twitter the other day, and and I'm intrigued, so I was following that, but now that I got an expert on, I, I would like to talk to you about it. If you could keep one, Kenny Galladay or Devontae Adams as a receiver, who do you keep? Okay. I'm keeping Devontae Adams, and I think Devontae Adams has a chance to be the number one wide receiver in fantasy football this year. and. No slight towards Kenny Galladay. I love Kenny Galladay. Not- I love Kenny Galladay. So this is hard for me, but I, I, I want to listen to what you're saying. Go ahead. Yeah, the age difference is not so substantial. So it's not like you're keeping one player and, you know, three years from now you're going to be kicking yourself because he's 37 and no longer effective. Devontae Adams could have the best season amongst all wide receivers in fantasy football. He got hurt last year, remember that toe injury against the Eagles, but still bounced back and was awesome down the stretch for Green Bay. Prior to that, he had three straight years with 10 or more receiving touchdowns. He was the only player in the NFL to accomplish that. So I'm sticking with Devontae Adams. I just think it's a little bit more of a proven product. And uh, Kenny Galladay is a star in the making, um, but the Lions might have more balance amongst catchers than the Packers. Packers need Devontae Adams to post 180 or 200 targets this year. Kenny Galladay could have 100 and it wouldn't be a major surprise. So give me Devontae Adams as my keeper between those two players. But Devon, uh, that, that's, again, that's no slight of Kenny Galladay. The guy is fantastic. Yeah, I mean, when you're, when you're saying you're going to, okay, I don't think Kenny Galladay is going to be upset if all of a sudden he's getting – not getting picked because the best receiver or maybe the guy who scores the most points in fantasy football goes ahead of you. I think you're, I think most guys game respects game and I'm pretty sure getting would appreciate that. But field man, I just got to tell you, thank you so much for taking time uh, to, to jump on with me on bridges brawl. Uh, this means a ton to me and I know my viewers and my uh, listeners are going to just appreciate this a, a ton. And uh, thank you so much for uh, what you do, not only for, for football, but for continuing just to, to, to bring uh, 
uh, I guess the good words of, of not only fantasy football, but just football and life in general to, to the masses. And, and again, thank you so much for joining on the show and for me learn a little bit more about your history. And, and I'm excited now to be keep tuning into ESPN to watch you drop some nuggets. I appreciate that. And I'll be looking forward to seeing where your son ends up playing his college football. And in the meantime, stay well, stay safe, and let's hopefully have some football to watch sometime soon. Amen, man. God bless. We'll talk to you later. Again, thank you to Field Yates for joining Bridges Brawl. Again, you can find this on Spotify, iTunes, and all the Google podcasts. Again, Bridges Brawl on Twitter, Facebook, 